So thank you. Uh, I don't have any visual aids. Um, I, I will demonstrate a very a little bit of, of, of vocal work in, later in the, in the, in the paper. Um, ben Spat. Um, I'm going to talk about something that may in this context um, be a little bit elementary, but I, I hope that what I say about it won't be banal. I should say that I'm coming from a context where uh, I'm looking at voice and movement and um, more than voice and movement, but sort of embodied practice and all that's possible in the, in the human body. And so the musical aspect of what I'm doing is uh, only one part of it. Um, but uh, I, I've decided to focus on that. And there's this sort of one idea that I want to test in this context. So I do have a paper which I will, which I'll, which I'll read. Uh, and um, I would love to hear your thoughts. What is a song? That is the question I want to consider today, speaking out of an embodied research practice and using the language of Deleuzean ontology to see if I can articulate the structure of that practice without reducing it to existing forms of musical analysis. Let me begin by mentioning a few different ways in which we could answer the question, what is a song? First, we could define a song as a structure of vocalized sounds captured by a musical score. This is the traditional musical way of thinking of understanding song and one used by many composers who work with voice. This ontology supports powerful methods of musicological analysis because an entire song can be treated as a stable text and analyzed for mathematical and musical patterns. In the present context, I probably do not need to explain that this ontology also has some important limitations. Among them are the fact that it reifies a written document as a work in the sense critiqued by Lydia Gurr. It emphasizes those aspects of song that can be easily notated while disregarding those that cannot. It cannot account for the different ways in which the same song is sung in different contexts and it treats the human voice as an instrument essentially no different from any other instrument. Some of these limitations may be alleviated if we take audio recordings as ontologically prior in the definition of song. With an audio recording, there are fewer limitations on what can and cannot be captured, so that a given recording may capture small variations in melody and rhythm, as well as what Barth called the grain of particular voice, which are not easily transcribed. However, an audio recording is still a technological artifact rather than a living practice. This has led some contemporary musical thinkers to borrow from performance studies what I would call an ontology of the event, according to which a song is a unique moment of ephemeral and unrepeatable performance. While I understand the value of such an ontological shift, particularly in a discipline that is still very much grappling with the legacy of the written score, I do not consider it satisfactory. As enticing as an evental ontology may be, it has little to offer a laboratory or research-oriented practice. That's because if each performance event is unique, singular, and ephemeral, then a laboratory cannot produce any substantive transmissible results or outcomes, except in the same old forms of the written score and the recorded track, which are now ontologically denoted, demoted to the status of trace. So three possibilities, the score, the recording, and the ephemeral event. What then could be the relatively reliable epistemic object with which we can work in an embodied laboratory practice of song? A further possibility worth considering is that the key song object manipulated in the laboratory is nothing other than a fragment or chunk of one or more practitioners. Uh, that is to say, one or more human beings. When I say that I am conducting an embodied laboratory process or a process of embodied research, what I mean is that we do not bring written scores or audio recordings into the studio laboratory with us. Therefore, whatever songs we are working on must arrive through the medium of ourselves as human bodies and beings. In this sense, a song is a sedimented pattern in one or more human bodies. Through repetition, I sediment or cultivate a song within my being, where it resides as a cultivated organic resource, a relatively reliable affordance of my own embodiment, or perhaps we might say a fractional habitus, a small chunk or unit of repeatable technique. With this idea, we've in, to some degree arrived to a compromise between the technological stability of the written score, or audio track, and the uncapturable ephemerality of a performance event. So we now have a way of thinking about how the songs as cultivated organic resources or fractional units of habitus arrive in the laboratory space and how they are manipulated in it. However, we have not yet arrived at an alternative ontology of song, although we have now a way of describing how songs arrive and appear in the laboratory, they remain bound now to the individual bodies of which they are part. So we still do not have any way to comparatively analyze the songs or to account for the processes of transmission, teaching, learning, appropriation, etc. 
What then is the class, the ontological category of which the songs that dwell inside the practitioner are a part? When I sing a song, I am activating a cultivated organic resource in myself, performing a fractional unit of my habitus. But what is the structure of this resource as something that can affect others and indeed which can be shared or passed along to others? I cannot extract a cluster of neurons or bits of muscle from my body and put it into someone else's body. What then is the nature of the thing called song that can be shared between people? In the rest of my talk, I want to present one simple ontological idea that emerges from my embodied research practice and which I take to be a possible starting point for one or more alternative, vo vocal, onto alternative vocal ontologies that do not rely upon existing musical notation systems and which describe a distinct space of song. The source of this ontological idea is Manuel de Landa's analytical reading of Deleuze's ontology in his book, Intensive Science and Virtual Philosophy. This is an especially analytical and mathematical interpretation of Deleuze. Setting aside the assumptions that underpin European musical notation, what kinds of events make up a given song? What types of embodied action cause a song to arrive in a given space? I want to propose, as a thought experiment, let's say, that songs are made up of symmetry-breaking events. In other words, the structure of a given song, that which allows us to conclude that two people in different times or spaces are singing the same song, is best understood not as a composition of sounds with specific pitches and durations, but as a sequence or cascade of nested events that successively break the implicit symmetry of silence. Songs, therefore, have fractal and not linear structure. The simplest songs are thresholds into genres or areas of vocal technique, and every song, no matter how complex, can be used as a starting point for additional complexity. Song lines, we might call them, are lines in musical space with dimensions corresponding to the possible symmetries of the voice, all the ways in which vocal phenomena can be transformed and varied. Any given song can be conceived of as a point along such a line or pathway, which defines its specific qualities and its ability to transform time and space in particular ways. In order to sing a particular song, a practitioner or ensemble must break the relevant symmetries in order to arrive at that point. In some cases, there are multiple roots to the same song. In other cases, the relevant symmetries must be broken in a particular order. I will not be able to comprehensively work through this idea here, but let me begin to suggest how we might apply Delanda's ontology to a rethinking of song. I should note here that Delanda borrows liberally from con concepts from mathematical set theory without either acknowledging that his borrowing is metaphorical or providing evidence that it is mathematically sound. While this is an important issue for analytically minded philosophers, it does not concern me much here. My usage of mathematical terms is based on Delenda's, and I'm not concerned with how far these analogies can be pushed on the mathematical side, at least not for the moment. Delenda proposes a topological ontology in contrast to a metric one. By this he means that points in space, and space here refers to any metaphorical space of possibilities, not just an actual physical space, have relative relationships rather than absolute relationships with each other. A simple example, the kind of key simple example proposed by Delanda is the, the, the relationship between cardinal and ordinal numbers. Cardinal numbers have fixed distances between them, allowing us to say, for example, that the distance between two and five is the same as between five and eight. An ordinal series has an order, but there's no metric grid underpinning it. Hence, it's possible to say that third comes after second and before fourth, but it's not possible to compare the distances because they are not quantities. In Deleuze and Guattari's terms, the space of cardinal numbers is striated while the space of ordinal numbers is smooth. Delanda calls the latter space topological because the distances between points are stretchy. This distinction applies directly to the difference between song as notated score and song as vocal technique. While the horizontal and vertical lines of traditional musical notation literally striate the page, dividing it into cardinally related notes and measures, the space of actual song in practice is smoother and more topologically flexible. One can slow down or speed up a song, change its starting pitch, and in some cases even the relative distances between pitches without changing or breaking its identity. By measure, Delanda means a quantified unit of space or time, but the musical definition of measure also falls within this definition. In order to transcribe a song into European musical notation, I have first of all to measure it, to place it within a set of quantified measures, a time grid according to which the song can be measured. 
But this is precisely what we need to avoid if we are to grasp how song manifests in embodied vocal practice. Delanda writes that cardinal numbers emerge from ordinal numbers through symmetry breaking. In this sense, the imposition of a musical staff upon a blank page is an example of symmetry breaking. It metricizes time by dividing it into measures, and it metricizes pitch space by dividing it into a scale of set intervals, issues of intonation aside. Yet these divisions remain somewhat flexible and relative without further specification such as key signature or an indication of tempo. Thus the musical space made available through notation comprises a number of different symmetry breaking specifications. These may fit well with the symmetry breaking events that define a given song, but not necessarily. To understand the embodied technique of song as distinct from notation, we need to go back and examine its originating symmetry, which is not that of the empty musical staff or even the blank page, but rather of the silent voice. In the silence that precedes or follows song, there is by definition no song per se. However, the architecture of a musical ontology is already present. Since we are not working with a musical staff, there are no measures or bars, no specifically sanctioned or disallowed notes or intervals, rhythms or tempos, colors or qualities. What we have is the unactivated human voice with its infinite but not at all unlimited capacity to produce sound. As noted above, these capacities are not those of specific individuals, even though that's what we have to work with in practice, uh, but the relatively reliable capacities of vocalization and hearing across bodies. Cognitive science, we know, can measure some of these capacities, but it is only through the practice of singing and listening that we can discover the various ways in which the symmetry of this pre-vocal silence can be broken. For Delanda, a key metaphor of symmetry-breaking processes is the development of an egg or seed into an organism. Metaphorically, he writes, and this is a little block quote, an egg may be compared to a topological space which undergoes a progressive and qualitative differentiation to become a metric space represented, to become the metric space represented by a fully formed organism. In this sense, the fertilized egg, defined mostly by gradients and polarities, as well as the early embryo defined by neighborhoods with fuzzy borders and ill-defined qualities, May be, viewed, may be viewed as a topological space which acquires a rigidly metric anatomical structure as tissues, organs, and organ systems become progressively better defined and relatively fixed in form. So it's a temporal process, but it's not one that goes from one end of the egg to the other. It's one that in this, in this uniform, relatively uniform space, there's a gradual process of differentiation, differentiation, differentiation. The egg is initially symmetrical in that its contents are relatively unformed and uniform. Gradually, polarities emerge, including one that will form the main axis of the organism from front to back or top to bottom. Additional polarities will distinguish additional axes of differentiation, and eventually neighborhoods composed of cell types will coalesce and solidify through their own symmetry-breaking processes to form specific organs. According to Delenda, this process of progressive differentiation is achieved through a complex cascade of symmetry-breaking phase transitions. Each transition breaks a particular symmetry of a previous state, rendering the organism more differentiated and eventually giving it its more stable and complex structure in space. This is how I would like to think of the cascade of events that define a song. Beginning with the undifferentiated egg of silence, the pure potential of the unactivated voice, let us ask what kinds of symmetry can be broken by the voice. Of course, the egg of silence is not entirely undifferentiated. The spectrum of pitch is inherently asymmetrical because the range of human hearing and the distinctive qualities of different vocal registers. Hence, a sense of low and high pitch already exists before any note is sounded. Likewise, looped rhythm has a roughly maximum and minimum durations. Uh, hence, even in silence, there is an implicit sense of what is fast and what is slow. However, within these general cognitive spaces afforded by the organism, there remains a large range of symmetries to be broken by specific vocal actions. I'll, I'll illustrate this using a very simple Yiddish folk song, which is part of my current embodied research, and which in its first manifestation now is hardly recognizable as a song, let alone any particular song. Un, 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 un. Un, 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 un. 
As a song or song fragment, this simple pattern remains symmetrical across a number of possible variations. For example, I could speed up the pulse. I could slow it down. I could vocalize a higher pitch. I could vocalize a lower pitch. Whatever tempo and pitch I choose, I'm fundamentally doing the same thing each time I enact this song. I'm breaking two symmetries, the symmetry of time and the symmetry of pitch. The initiation of a single pulse in time creates a sense of looped duration. Time is no longer undifferentiated. It now has zones, the pulse, just after the pulse, in between the pulses, just before the pulse. Also, pitch space is no longer undifferentiated. The vocalized pitch not only divides the pitch, the pitch spectrum into spaces above and below, it also implies potential intervals, potential harmonic intervals, with their own specific qualities, so that more and less resonant pitches are now asymmetrically available within the pitch space. In this way, melodic and temporal space have had their fundamental symmetries broken, leading to increased differentiation. This is not yet measurement, however. With a single looped pulse in the space, there is only one duration, the duration of the loop and no sense of comparative duration, long or short. Time has become ordinal, but not yet cardinal. Similarly, with a single pitch in the space, there is not yet any tonality, except that which is inherent to the human organism. Other possible pitches could now be classified ordinally in relation to the vocalized pitch, but no cardinal system of intervals, such as a scale or mode, has yet appeared. We can note that some intervals, such as a fourth, a perfect fourth, or fifth are more resonant than others, but the spectrum of possible notes and qualities remains fully open. Let's now consider a slightly more complicated song fragment, same song, a little longer piece. We have now further broken both rhythmic and melodic symmetries. In terms of rhythm, we have not only multiplied the pulse by four, which would have in a certain sense retained the previous symmetry, but have placed emphasis on one of the four, thereby breaking the symmetry further. The addition of the melody also creates a similarity between the middle two notes, further breaking the symmetry of the rhythm. The arrival of this melody with its three intervals also cements a, t a sense of tonality around the original pitch, further metricizing the melodic space. If we sing the complete song, we further cement a particular sense of rhythmicity and tonality. So far, we've been thinking in the most basic terms about how the inaction of rhythm and melody through song can be understood as symmetry-breaking events that structure various kinds of perceived musical space. In fact, the situation is much more complex because a voiced sound is not just its fundamental pitch, but all the specific resonances and grain of that voice, some of which remains constant and some of which changes from one sound into the next. Nor have I mentioned vocables, in this case Yiddish words, that have arrived along with the melodic and rhythmic structure of the song, but the previous paper masterfully analyzed that whole area. Or the symmetries that could be broken by a second or third voice singing in unison, in a round formation, or in any other harmonic relation. Rather than catalog the various symmetries that can be broken in the practice of a given song, my aim has only been to show how an alternative ontology might be developed with which to understand the complexities of embodied singing technique as distinct from notation-based composition. 
Rather than treating a song as a linear structure of specific notes or sounds and durations, this ontology sees song as a layered montage of broken and retained symmetries. Among the implications of this shift is the sense that one can enter and dwell within a given song or song fragment for a potentially unlimited amount of time. A song no longer has a beginning and ending point, beginning and ending points, but instead is built up out of layers, each of which can be enacted independently, although as I note above, some layers may depend upon other layers, and hence the order of enaction may not always be entirely open. For example, one can enter the rhythm of a song without its melody, and vice versa, but one cannot work with harmonic intervals unless there is already a melody in the space. So in some cases you can break the symmetries in any order, and in some cases they depend upon each other. One can decompose a song into shorter loops, develop alternative versions of a song that break the various symmetries in different ways, and create larger scale compositions out of these elements. I do not think that any of the technique I'm describing here, any of the vocal technique I'm describing here is particularly new. On the contrary, I think that working with song in this way is among the most common human practices. The musical space I am describing here is that of folk and ritual song. It is the space of mantra and chant. Unfortunately, this musical space has rarely been granted the same ontological status of that as that of written notation. Historically, many attempts have been made to raise folk and ritual music to the level of notated musical works by transcribing it. Only relatively recently has the reductive nature of transcription been acknowledged. But audio recording is also reductive. It too fails to capture song as flexible embodied technique. For this, we need a different ontology, a vocal ontology, an ontology of song that begins and ends with the iterative structure of embodied practice. Thank you. I think we are, a, I think that there's something implied by the notion of symmetry, but I'm not sure what it is. And, I, and I, I've been sort of testing how far the, the mathematics of symmetry are applicable. Um, but in a really general sense, uh, if what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to look at is in singing, particularly in singing in repetition, so short repetition, long repetition, repetition over weeks or months or years or and across different bodies, um, the way that the song changes while keeping its identity um, are all symmetries in a, in a, in a, on an elementary mathematical sense that it is, it, it's kind of, there's a, there's a, there's a way in which those are accurately called symmetries in the sense that you can transform the song and it stays the song. So that space of the ways that we vary the song in repetition through our voice, yeah, I think it is, it, it, it has its own structure. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure what the structure is of it, um, but it seems to be a, I don't know if it's the same space as the, the blank page. Uh, I, I mean, I, I often refer to the empty room uh, as the kind of starting point, and I think maybe the empty room has different symmetries than the blank page, if that's the way to say it. And it's not to say that it doesn't have any, I mean, it has its own structure, and to say, let's go into the space and sing, has a different structure than to say I'm going to sit down and make some music. Um, it, it does have its own structure, but 
It's not, I'm not sure, I don't think it's the same structure. Where was the recognizability? Where this, this idea that you could transform the object. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that's true. Um, I think in some way, I, I'm, the thing that interests me is that there's some, to, 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 to get at how those things function on a very simple level, maybe, because they... They, they, they probably do carry forth to much more complex uh, both compositional and technological situations. Um, and I guess uh, this is almost to say um, that if we strip everything down in some way and it's just people singing in a room, um, some of those things are, are already at work. Mm -hmm. Except abstracting from the text, they would still be, the, you're still constructing uh, something that can then be transformed and, and the audience is, is still uh, on hold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the, that 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 premise that um, that it's it's an embodied practice that is involving other aspects of the human body as well as the voice um, is the is the that's the premise on which I'm trying to find structural language analytical language for the musical aspect because um, if the musical aspect begins from song in the context of music and, and com the complexities of, 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 of song uh, in the musical lineage then, uh, or, or on a cello, for example, if you begin, uh, then many of the possibilities that I'm exploring in terms of movement and interaction in the space and all that are foreclosed. So the premise that this musical, uh, this song aspect is part of some embodied event means that uh, it has to be simple on a certain level. I'm, I'm not sure if simple is the right word. It has to be uh, compatible with other kinds of things. And, but then, in this context, I'm looking at that from a musical perspective and saying, I'm trying to look at it from musical and philosophical, analytical, philosophical perspective and saying, okay, well, does it, what is its analytical structure then? 
uh, if it's really part of this other thing, can it, can it still be detached in some meaningful way and analyzed uh, as, as having a structure on its own, like a musical structure um, that is distinct from the other interactions and movements and uh, associations that might be also part of it. For example, if the song is um, if the song is looped, then you can uh, if the song and if it's fairly simple, then you can explore some other thing that uh, changes throughout the song, movement or interaction or association, uh, and then you get a kind of a spiral. So there's a there's a linear development, but the the song aspect of it is is looped. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I was thinking of the folk memory, if you're talking about folk music, yes. the, the common memory of what a certain song, the events it conjures up, or the, right. the occasions it conjures up, that's uh, right. very powerful. Yeah, it's the, that's one of the things, for example, that, that this is in relation to the simplicity of the musical structure. So to try to kind of find an analytical language for the musical structure that can hold that other, all of that other material. It grieves me to draw this session to a close. It's been the most fascinating mm -hmm. series of presentations I've ever had. Thank you.